Okay. <sighs> Take a deep breath. Exhale. And three. So, as you can see, Gus, <clears throat> Gus is here. I believe this is the second time, but for sure we know it's the second time. And uh, we're glad to have him back. He's, he's been in Manitoba for this weekend. Brandon swung over uh, here, and as I said, he flies home to Quebec tomorrow. And so we're glad to have him here. Your team is hugely thorough. You guys have got to play, and he'll talk a little bit more about that. And there'll be a short interval between the two sessions where you'll have a chance to do that. So let's pray, and then I'm going to turn it over to him right away. So Lord, tonight, as your people here, created by you. We know that, Lord. We we have a an internal, you have put eternity in the hearts of men. We know that we are created by you. But Lord, it would seem that we should be in the minority and we would have to defend that. We live in a fallen world. And so we would ask God that tonight some of the things that we need to know would be established in us as we learn, as we listen, and as we allow you to, to speak truth into us through your servant here. So we welcome Gus, and we are glad that we're able to be here together now. We ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Are we live? Can everybody hear me okay? Well, it's nice to me uh, to be here back in Manitoba. How many were here the last time that I was here? How many remember me? Wow, it's amazing. <laughs> I hardly remember myself. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I speak of Accretion Ministries International. I was st been doing that part-time since 2013, and I'm still doing that part-time. I'm what we call a remote speaker. They, I live in Montreal. The office is in Ontario, and they just simply said, okay, Gus, we want you to go to here this, to give this talk, blah, 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 and then come back home. So I'm not a, a full-time employee of the... Uh, of a CMI. I do, I have just retired last June. I don't know if I mentioned last time, I was going to retire. For about 10 years, I was going to retire. Finally, I retired. And it's, uh, I'm never going back. After 45 years in aviation, 39 in Bombardier, and CAE uh, working on uh, technical training on business jets. Anybody heard of Bombardier business jets? Uh, okay, everybody, yeah. yeah, here's a tip. Don't buy their shares. That's a, been a disaster because I bought them through payroll savings. Yeah, as, the save, as I was saving, the value was going down. <laughs> that's, that's not a, one day they're going to be worth something. Yes, well, I'm not sure they're going to be long, uh, alive long enough for that to happen. But that's another story. So, uh, so I've been retired, and it's great. Uh, I'm also involved with uh, Muslim background Iranians and uh, part of Iranian Christian Fellowship Alliance. And uh, we are trying to help Iranians who come to Canada, most of them as refugees, come to Christ and also get established in churches and things like that. You might say, you're not Iranian, Gus. No, that's right. My name is Dutch. Anybody else Dutch here? <laughs> what? God bless you, sir. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so you sound, that sounds a lot like Arabic, you know, the <laughs> So I, that's why I get along. But actually, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm uh, they ask me because I'm not Iranian. Iranians have this trub problem of fighting all the time. They always fight again. Even pastors, I, I'm getting off topic here, but the pastors, I had one pastor say, I'm not talking to this guy ever again. This guy's a pastor. <laughs> anyway. Anyhow, so let's get on to dinosaurs. I'm sure that's a, just uh, into my life. I now uh, I have four grown sons. The oldest has just turned 40 this year. 40. Wow, and I have five grandchildren, age from, uh, age from 12 down to one. It's wonderful. I think grandparents, grandparenting is the best, yeah. right? How many are grandparents here? Oh, yeah, wonderful. God bless you all. Five grandchildren, wow. And they're 12. Oof, won't happen. Okay, dinosaur. I, I, just keep tapping me like, if I'm off track. Okay, so. <laughs> So dinosaurs, everybody's heard about dinosaurs. When I was a kid, I loved dinosaurs. And uh, every, having four sons, I got all kinds of dinosaur models and Tyrannosaurus Rex is always eating the Triceratops. And, rah, rah, rah. and it was great. Uh, so now my grandsons are doing the same thing, dinosaurs. So these were kind of very familiar with everyone. And, uh, but however, dino and they are an icon of evolution because dinosaurs come with a price. The price of 
accepting of dinosaurs is usually with millions of years. So whenever you hear of a dinosaur find or a fossil, it's so many hundreds of millions of years, et cetera, et cetera. And dinosaur died out a million, 65 million years or, uh, ago. So we're, there, there's always a price to pay for dinosaurs. And um, so that creates a bit of a problem for Christians who say, I don't believe the earth is even that old. Now, maybe you do, but I mean, saying for Christians who go by the biblical account, if you go by the genealogies of Adam, and it's very well detailed in Genesis 5 and in Chronicles and Luke. It goes all the way back to, you know, from Adam to Christ. I mean, it's continuous. You have maybe 6,000 years. You can't stretch it out to billions. It ain't going to work, right? So, but if dinosaurs died out 65 million years, it's not going to work either. Either the Bible is true, and that means the dinosaurs aren't that old, or else the dinosaurs are that old, and the Bible has some reconfiguring required. Okay. We don't want to go there. So, Anyway, so how do we start with this? Well, let's look at what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that God made everything in six days. We believe they were 24-hour days, just like an ordinary day. I know some people have different opinions on that, but we believe that this is sound biblical hermeneutics for that. And of course, after all these days, he had said to it that, well, it was very good. Everything is made very good. That means that that there was no death at this point. There was no animal eating of people for people, and there was no people eating for animals. It was a symbiotic relationship. We're kind of an agreement on that point. We, you don't eat me, I'm going to eat you. Okay, so that's what it was. life was like after God had made everything very, very good. But, of course, we know that that story didn't end there. And uh, that they, although it was very good, it became very bad. Why? Because God told Adam, Adam and Eve... You know, there's one thing you don't, you're not supposed to do. Of everything that you get to do in this world, which is perfect, there's only one thing I don't want you to do. Now, don't you eat of the fruit of the tree, because if you do, you're going to begin the process of dying. The so Satan came along in the guise of a serpent and said, God's lying to you. He knows that when you eat of the fruit of this tree, your eyes are going to be open. You're going to, you're going to have knowledge that you would not otherwise have. God is holding out on you. You can't trust him. And Adam believed him. And then he believed God because he then started to die because God said that if you do eat of it, you're going to die. That's when death and disease and suffering brought, came into the world. That's what the Bible tells us. Evolution, however, is a different story, but uh, we'll talk a, look about, a bit more about that in the second lecture. So um, then, of course, that brought death and disease and suffering to the world. But we still have a problem with our dinosaurs. We still have a problem with dead things. How do we reconcile that? Do we say that they happened before? No, it wouldn't make sense before Adam because it wouldn't make sense biblically. So that would mean then that the fossils, which are found in the rock strata, must all have happened since creation, in the past 6,000 years. So that means that dinosaurs are not 6,000 years old and the rock strata are not millions of years old. Okay, so that's... That's what we're working with, okay? So the Bible puts a bit of constraints on it, but that's how the theology of the Bible works. We start from the Bible, believing that the Bible is superior to man's opinion. God was there, God made it, and we believe the scripture is infallible, inerrant, and that you can trust God before you can trust man. Especially when scientists say, well, our theories are always being updated. You know, we're, we're, when new information comes along, we update our theories. Yes, and that's the problem. Because what you're telling me then is that what you're telling me now is not going to be what you're telling me in the future. I cannot rely on science. If, you can tell me, if you're going to tell me that your theories are going to change every year or whatever, you, every time you feel like it. Okay? So that is a bit of a problem and uh, why you can't necessarily trust science in general. We'll talk a bit more about that in the second lecture. Uh, as well. So, Adam's sin brought death and disease and suffering, and the fossil record is a snapshot of all those things that died captured in the, in the rock strata, including dinosaurs. Well, what about dinosaurs? Well, dinosaurs, we grew up with this. This is our introduction to dinosaurs. Fred Flintstones and Barney Rubble and Bam Bam and, of course, the Dino the Dinosaur, which is the dog-like pet. And uh, so, this is our introduction to the different types of dinosaurs. 
um, brontosaurus burgers. I always thought they were great. They were rather large, but I mean, Fred Flintstone had a big appetite. And then we were introduced to all these kinds of models and, and, and uh, toys. Well, I still have a whole whack of them in the basement and, you know, and so anyway, there's a lot, that's what boys like to play with that thing. But what happened to the dinosaurs? Are there dinosaurs still today? Let's see where you were to go to a university, a mainstream university, and ask them to the uh, paleontology uh, department. If you ask them, uh, is dinosaurs still living today? What would they say? Sorry? No, they would not say no. They would say yes. Yeah. Oh, now I have your interest. Okay, so now you're paying attention. Okay, good. So when did dinosaurs die out? Well, they told us the dinosaurs died out about 65 million years ago when some kind of asteroid and, uh, hit, hit the Yucatan Peninsula or who knows where and created this vast uh, at this catastrophe which wiped out all the dinosaurs and they were then covered in uh, soot and debris and stuff and they were all buried and they died. Okay, that wiped out all the dinosaurs. Get a problem with that, but... What about another scenario? Is another possible scenario that they actually were buried in a global flood? I mean, that's a possibility, isn't it? That if you have a global flood, flood comes along and all these animals are trying to run away, but they get buried in the flood and they get sediment to sediment on top of it, and then you have fossils being made, and that's what we see in the fossil record, in the rocks. Okay, but that, of course, would only have happened in the time of Noah, which is about 4,500 years ago. One of the things you're going to notice that the paleontologists and the scientific community do not allow a global flood. They cannot have a global flood because a global flood would wipe out billions of years, which is which evolution is supposed to take. Instead of having a, you know, uh, something uh, taking very, very slow processes over a very long period of time, a global flood would have made it all happen in a very uh, fast period of time, in orders of magnitude. So they cannot allow a global flood. And of course, isn't that exactly what Peter says in Second Peter, talking about that deny that the world was created out of water and deluged by water. Exactly the fulfillment of the, what Peter said. And yet Jesus and the apostles both all believed in the global flood. Hmm, interesting. Well, what do we know about dinosaurs? I remember one guy telling me that uh, Satan put uh, dinosaur fossils in the rocks to confuse Christians. <laughs> and I told him, don't ever say this to anybody ever again. Right? <laughs> this is one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. I'd also heard recently on Mark Driscoll, I don't know if you like the guy or not, but he was interviewing a lady about dinosaurs. She said dinosaurs never existed. I'm thinking, uh, how do you square that circle, right? Where you have all these fossils, what do you, it's like her eyes are blinded on. The reason why she did that was because she wasn't willing to pay the price for the dinosaurs, right? Because when, as I said, the price of having dinosaurs is the millions of years. She couldn't accept the millions of years because that would mess up the Bible. So she just simply assumed that dinosaurs never existed. But there's, that's not the way to approach it. The way to approach it is, yes, there were dinosaurs, but they're not connected to the age. The age is assumed. Instead of the dinosaurs being millions of years old, maybe in fact they were only thousands of years old in keeping with the global flood. That would work, and that would satisfy a biblical point of view, and also the fact that there were dinosaurs, and there were many of them, and they were located around, all, all around the world. In fact, here you see fossil remains have been literally found all over the world, including up north of Russia, and in uh, uh, Greenland, and in Antarctica. How are you going to have dinosaurs living in there where the environment is hostile for humans? Even if we wear multiple clothes, nobody's going to live there year-round and, and certainly uh, grow, have families up there, right? So how would the dinosaurs be up there? So the idea was people have to think of, well, either those animals migrated up there when it was very, very cold, but that doesn't really make sense because they're not really that kind of creatures and, you know, they need a lot of heat, or else that where they were living, actually the continents moved to where they are now. Okay. In the global flood, one of the models is catastrophic plate tectonic, where there was a single continent, all the water was gathered up by God, and there was water all around, and you, during the flood of Noah, the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and then split open the, this massive continent and broke it up into the continents we have today. So instead of a continental sprint or a continental drift like we say now that the continents are moving in relation to each other, it was a continental sprint. 
Things were moving rapidly. So the animals which had come out of the ark, it's going to take a while for these continents to move, but they would have been on there. And then as the continents themselves take the animals to these farther regions. And then, of course, the temperature got colder, and then they died, and they were buried, etc. So that might explain it. Well, of course, in Canada, we have lots of dinosaurs, including in Alberta. We have uh, Dinosaur National Park, and we have Drumheller and the Royal Tyro Museum, which isn't really a dinosaur museum. It's an evolutionary indoctrination museum, which is really what it is. If you go through there, it walks you through evolution. Kids are there. It's a notebook. So I'm explaining, oh, you know, if, uh, you know, several billion years ago this happened, it's several hundred thousand years. It's an, it's an evolutionary indoctrination. When I went through it a little while ago when I was speaking in Calgary, in, uh, in, in Alberta, so you need to be aware of that, that, uh, uh, you know, in fact, many of the dinosaur fossils there aren't even from Alberta. They're from other places because they, they, gotta, they didn't die there. So what do we know about dinosaurs? Well, dinosaurs come in two groups, two major groups. By the way, uh, it has long been believed that dinosaurs were reptiles. They were cold-blooded and, uh, like, reptiles can continue to grow. They get bigger as they get older and it seems like that happens to some humans as well, but um, <laughs> not necessarily, just this clothes shrink over time. I don't know why that is. But um, so they thought that the dinosaurs were reptiles. They no longer think that. They think that dinosaurs are a unique, separate kind of creature for various reasons that we are going to uh, touch on some of them. So the dinosaurs come in two varieties or two major groups or orders. Uh, first of all, they are not there, we have flying reptiles, these things like uh, pterodactyls, pterodon, and quetzalcoatlus. These are not re dinosaurs. They are simply flying reptiles. And we also have those creatures that live in the sea, you know, um, in the ocean. And these are called marine reptiles. And then, of course, we have the run-of-the-mill average. Who cares about them reptiles? Okay? These are just alligators, crocodiles. Compared to the dinosaurs, <laughs> they're not that scary. But unless you happen to be right next to one. Okay, so dinosaurs are not reptiles, and they are not marine reptiles and flying reptiles. Uh, but they come in two orders. They have the Sauricea, or the lizard hip, or the Ornithia. And it has to do with the, the lizard hip, have to do with the way they're straddling the hips like this, okay, versus a bird has a more straight down hip. Okay, so, so let me back, come back to the question. We said, I said anyway, that... Uh, if you go into universities, they will tell you that dinosaurs still exist. You're thinking, what? What are you talking about? Because they believe that dinosaurs uh, or birds evolved from dinosaurs. That as the dinosaurs were being changed gradually into birds. And so they called them, the ones, the typical ones, they're non-avian dinosaurs, and the birds are called the avian dinosaurs. Now we're going to look at that, actually, how that could actually happen. It's a whole lot of magic. But <laughs> seriously, I mean, to, to envision how physically this could happen is mind-boggling, but that's the story. Okay, so which order of dinosaurs do you think became the birds? The lizard hip or the bird hips? <laughs> it's the lizard hips. <laughs> I'm not making this stuff up. There are five suborders of dinosaurs. That includes the thera theropoda, which are the like a Tyrannosaurus rex. There's also the sauropodomorpha, of which the sauropods or the long-necked dinosaurs, like apatosaurs. And then you also have the ornithopoda, hadrosaur. Okay. Say it very fast. Marginless sylcephia. These are the ones with the margins or the crest. Okay, they're called crested dinosaur or ceratopsian. And uh, I use love all these big words and make me sound like I know what I'm talking about. And thyrophora, which are the armored dinosaurs, like ankylosaur, right? They're just, just monsters. We're going to see a picture of that later on. So is this a dinosaur? No, it's a, it's a flying reptile. It's called a Quetzalcoatl. But it gives you some idea of the size of creatures that live pre-flood. The conditions that were before the flood were quite radically different than they are now, okay? And um, it has, it's uh, the difference in size, like uh, on Algonquin Park, if you were to go to Algonquin Park in Ontario, and you look at one of the displays, of course, Algonquin Park has beavers, and a regular beaver is about this big, and have a beaver head about this big, they have a beaver head about this big. Beavers would grow up to this big, okay? And they can take out big trees, okay? <laughs> 
right? But so what could have happened and to change from a huge monster beaver and, and dragonflies with one meter long wingspan? Okay, well, obviously something happened. It's probably connected more to genetics than it does to atmosphere or anything like that, but it's still a question to be discussed. So how do we know about dinosaurs? Well, because we have these fossils. Paleontologists dig around and they find these fossil finds all over the world, and then they try to excavate them from the rock because dinosaur bones, for the most part, are rock. They've been fossilized. And so they have to separate that, the, the, the rocks of the bones, which were bones, from the rocks that are surrounding it. They have to be very carefully. And then, of course, once they got the bones, they have a, they're going to have a whole bunch of pieces. So they have to tie them all together, usually put them in plaster cast in order so they can take the whole thing and bring it to a, 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 you know, a laboratory to start assembling them and figuring out how they all work. But there's a lot of things we don't know about dinosaurs. But we don't know what color they were. Right? Could have been many, many colors. And, uh, but we don't have any... Skin, although we do have some samples of pigment, but certainly all the dinosaurs, we don't know what colors they were. They could have been fluorescent red, who knows, right? Probably not, but I'm just supposing. Here we have an a, a, um, artist who drew a triceratops, very nice looking. Where did he get this idea of this is what it looked like? Well, he just got this from the fossil. All the rest has just been from artistic license. He just, and in fact, many of the remains of things that you see in media are artist imaginations of what they would have looked like if all of that was, you know, if they found all the bones and they put skin on it and flesh and et cetera, et cetera. But they don't. They just have bones like this. And sometimes they have them where they're all together so they can actually piece together what kind of creature it was, which is wonderful, and sometimes they don't. We also have different things on dinosaurs. For example, we have bite marks. There are actually holes in dinosaurs from where other dinosaurs bit them. They wanted to eat them. And we also have things like broken bones, which have been healed. We also have tumors from cancer. So these things were subject to, obviously, pain and death and suffering, uh, just like animals do today. And I mentioned, they, sometimes you find them all art, uh, articulated, all, and sometimes they're all disarticulated. In other words, they're just piles of bones. It's called a dinosaur boneyard. In some places, you have something like the remains of 10,000 dinosaurs, like hadrosaurs, and then you ask yourself, how could they all be jumbled up like that? Well, obviously, the dinosaurs must have been in some kind of a herd, indicating they were, might have been herding instinct. So they were herding animals, at least certain kinds. And then they were overwhelmed by some kind of catastrophe, maybe something like uh, water and that covered them all up and then buried them and they all died and the turbulent flow ripped them all apart and then all we have left are these bones. If you were to go to Colorado and Utah at the National uh, Monument, of Dinosaur National Monument, you can actually see a wall, probably about the, about the length of the church here, uh, of uh, inc inclined about 50 different kinds of dinosaurs, all in this wall. So they were digging in that area, and they were, hey, hey, we got a dinosaur, a dinosaur fossil. Well, look at that. Well, look here, over here's another one of a different kind of animal. And they admit that these animals were all brought there together by some kind of a local flood where they were in a valley and then the flood came along and then buried them all and then turned them all into fossils over a period of time. Well, that sort of fits a bit with the Bible, but burial and uh, turns things into fossils. This is what happened. We'll talk about that in the second lecture, which is amazing evidence, <coughs> which is amazing evidence for a young universe. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, boy cites the crack. All right, so another thing they have, like, uh, they actually have reconst uh, this model particularly is of a uh, National Geographic, had this of a, a, a full-size cast of a dinosaur. This is one of the armored dinosaurs, an ankylosaur type of dinosaur. And you can see that uh, had various body parts on there. So it gives us an idea, a look into what they would actually look like with their skin on it. Only part of it was found, and here's the head, and it, uh, you see the eye socket. Uh, and of course, this must have been a formidable beast with the, uh, the skin, and etc. that it would have been very hard for any animal to try to attack it. One of the interesting things, as you see that particular pi picture there, is the stomach contents. You can actually see what it had been eating, including stones. Sometimes these animals eat stones to grind up, just like chickens have these, and, and birds have gullets to, uh, to do that. So this gives us some insight into the dinosaurs themselves. Uh, and. Uh, the very fact that you can fossilize stomach contents indicates it must have happened very, very quickly. 
because otherwise the stomach contents would have just rotted away into goo. And how big were dinosaurs? Well, big, we'll talk about how big they were, but we know that, you know that they were monstrous size. But how big did they start? What size did they start at? You know, an elephant baby, well, elephant's a fairly big animal, but the, but the baby is also a pretty big animal, right? And of course, a baby whale is like a big animal too. But dinosaurs start as eggs. And so the, the guy's holding about the largest dinosaur egg ever found. Wow. So from small beginnings, and the other one looks like a cantaloupe. That's the marriage fruit. Cantaloupe? <laughs> Sorry, a little bit of humor in there, but uh, <laughs> cantaloupe. Can... <laughs> okay, so anyway, you get an idea that the dinosaurs started out as eggs, and they then obviously went through some very uh, uh, significant growth to reach the sizes that they did. We'll talk about that. One of the things I've also found is dinosaur nest. Here's the remains of a fossilized uh, dinosaur nest and uh, over, over raptor, okay, egg-laying raptor, and you can see it's raptor claws, but you can also see the eggs on the nest. So this mother was sitting on her eggs and then was buried along with the eggs and became fossilized. And it's interesting to note the eggs were uh, typical laid two by twos. Seems to be in a pattern, a two by two and in a nest. This is a picture of what might have looked like in uh, uh, embryonic stage and inside the, inside the uh, egg. And uh, there's also fossils of uh, dinosaur footprints in the United States of a herd of dinosaurs going in a particular direction. All seem to be going in a particular direction and some dinosaurs laying eggs two by two as they go along. Probably a female who has been uh, egg bar barren and had a, didn't have time to like a nest, so to get rid of the eggs, they just laid them out as they went along. Okay, so they find that rather unusual and uh, to do that. And here's a artist rendition of a little baby dinosaur just coming out of the egg and a much larger one. I want to come up with a caption along the bottom. What would they be saying to each other? Obviously, the little fella is giving a lot of lip, <laughs> and I think the big well, he might have been thinking something nefarious, like lunch. Okay, but I just maybe you can picture that. It's a little cute. Maybe remember some of those kids' movies, you know, Land Before Time, and a little. Uh, anyway, so so dinosaurs, particularly sauropods, got to be massive creatures. Massive creature. Here's a femur, a leg bone of a dinosaur. Wow, you can imagine how big that was. In fact, this, some of the dinosaurs, Gigantosaurus, this thing got as long as, almost as long as the largest airliner, the Airbus 380. That's how long they got. Can you imagine how much this thing would have weighed and uh, how much it would have eaten in order to sustain or get to that weight to sustain it? Now, so if the dinosaurs started off as little as eggs, to get to this size, they're going to have to go through some kind of a growth spurt. And, uh, you know, having had four teenage sons, and now I've got a 12-year-old teenage uh, or grandson who's all of a sudden starting to shoot up like a rocket. Right? What happened? You know, soon he's going to have three legs. Since I last saw you, since I last saw you, I've grown another leg, he said. So now he's got three legs. To... Okay. <laughs> some people get it. I'll stick to dinosaurs. <laughs> okay, so what scientists have uh, believed is that the actual dinosaurs went, underwent a teenage growth spurt. So the weight, uh, the mass is on the side here. You can see this is in kilograms, so just multiply by 2.2 or double it to get the pounds, and along the bottom is age. So they believe that dinosaurs were very small up to around five years of age, and then they underwent a teenage growth spurt in which they then started to gain mass, an enormous amount of mass. In fact, some people calculated as much the mass of an African elephant every year. Some of them would have got up to 70,000 70, pounds or 35 tons, maybe even heavier than that. That's a lot of, a lot of uh, mass to accumulate, which means they would also have had to eat an enormous amount of food. Continuous, they were just eating machines, eating all the time which raises some interesting questions when many of these dinosaurs are found embedded, entombed in sand, which means that where they died was not where they lived. 
right? You would have found if you had coal seams or something like that, if they had lived in the area in Byron where it had a lot of vegetation. But in many cases, they were found in sandy area. Even in Alberta at the Drumheller, this is all sandstone regions where all the dinosaurs are found. But sand doesn't give a lot of trees and vegetation. So something had to move these from where they were, possibly in herd, to where they were buried and turned into fossils. Now, I mentioned that uh, evolutionists believe that, you know, when you don't have, you exclude God from the paradigm of origin and existence. When you exclude God, you have to have a natural explanation of how everything got here, right? And the natural explanation is, well, where did, uh, where did uh, birds come from? Well, they had to come from something. Well, but they came from dinosaurs. So the idea was that a dinosaur had a need to catch a dragonfly, and so to do that, they had to change their little shrimpy claws into wing. But to imagine how that could happen, you'd have to have two fully formed wings to make any good. What's, what's the good of having a half a wing? Right? We don't find these half things, right, or bits and pieces of things, because things which have mutations, which have half a wing, is usually not going to survive in the wild because it would be a disadvantage. They either have, they have to go literally from fully formed dinosaur to fully formed bird in order to survive. Anything in the middle which captured all that. Plus you have to think in terms of how do you change a land animal into a flying animal? For example, one of the things you have is a, uh, the breathing apparatus. We have lungs, right? So we actually breathe in and out of the same uh, sacks that are, are, are called our lungs, okay? But uh, birds don't have that. Birds have a flow-through system. In other words, we expel the, take the air in and expel it out the same in two directions, one in, one out. Birds don't do that. They have a circulatory system where it actually goes into the front of their lung and it goes out the back of their lung, okay? And it continues a continuous flow process which is very, very efficient because always oxygen is being exchanged with the carbon dioxide and rejuvenating the, the blood, okay? But how do you change from a, you know, a, a mammal type of lung to a bird type of lung all in one go? Because a half a go is gonna be a dead bird, <laughs> right? I mean, that's, it's gotta be wor fully working and that's the, the problem of irreducible complexity. It's either 100% or it's gonna die. And, you know, when you hear these goose fly, geese fly overhead, they go, honk, honk, honk. We think they're out of breath. Right? But that's not, that's not what they're doing. They're just signaling to each other, get going, come on, we can do it. We only got another 100 kilometers to go. Right? Maybe, but it's not because they're out of breath. And how do you get the muscles in the chest for birds? Like they have a breastbone. Okay, that provides a spring for the chest muscles for these things that continue to flap for hour after hour after hour. There's no way that dinosaurs have this type of, of mechanisms or these muscles. It, so to envision how this could have happened was uh, it's, it's miraculous, <laughs> literally. I mean, uh, people, it's nice to say that, oh, they did this. Okay, let's walk through it step by step. You know, superficially it sounds okay, but when you actually start looking at the details, eh, that ain't gonna work. However, do people do say, oh, we do have some evidence of transitional forms. Archaeopteryx is one of those classic transitional forms found in 1861. People said, well, look, it has some of this, the, the uh, resemblance of a dinosaur and some of it of a bird. Why, well, it has some feathers and it has claws like a raptor. So therefore, it must have been a transitional form between dinosaurs and birds. Superficially, it does look like that. So, but all the evolutionists are convinced, right? They're not. In fact, Dr. Fiducia said this, paleontologists have tried to turn Archaeopteryx into an earthbound feathered dinosaur, but it's not. It's a bird, a perching bird, and no amount of paleo babble is going to change that. So we do already have birds like this today, which do have claws on their, on their uh, legs and on their mid-wing. Okay, so you can't then say that that's a transitional form between dinosaurs and birds because we still have them, okay? It doesn't exist, okay? So there's a lot of make-up stories in this whole evolutionary scenario, and as long as you're only allowed to present those made-up stories, everybody buys it. But technically, it doesn't work. But then what's the alternative? The alternative is a created account 
creation account. God made creatures to reproduce after the kind. That's religious. We don't talk about religion in science. So therein lies a bit of a problem. So where do we go from here? We've got the Bible. The Bible is God's word to us. We believe that it is superior to man's word. So if God said certain thing happened and this is the way it was done, you know, this is what we believe. Is, is the Bible a book of science? A lot of people said, well, you know about how the origin of the universe, you can't go to the Bible because the, 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 the Bible is not a book of science. But that is irrelevant because it was not, God did not use natural processes to create the universe. He used supernatural ones. So when people said, God explained to us how you did it, God said, nope. I'm not going to explain anything to you because all God said, all, that's really all he did. God said, and it was. Explain to me how you do it. How can us, how can we, it doesn't, God just spoke and it was. Now that's a faith statement, but it explains the origin of the universe. And evolutionists have their faith statement as well. They believe it happened by evolution. Well, exactly how did it work? It, evolution. So instead of using God, they use evolution. It becomes a, instead of a God in the gap, it becomes an evolution in the gap. Whenever you don't have a specific answer, evolution did it. It's evolution. It's evolution, that's it. And it literally become a God. A God that made us. This mindless, natural process that brought us here today. And we all need to bow down to evolution, which is really a pagan religion, which is really what is being followed. So where do we fit the, uh, the dinosaurs? Well, the marine reptiles and the flying reptiles would have been made on day five, along with you know, the birds and the, uh, the whales and other creatures like that. Uh, dinosaurs being land animals, they would have been made on day six. Okay? And, uh, of course, God had said that everything was very good. I'm an evil in this garden. Uh, and uh, she said, well, it's very good. Well, it was. It was very, very good. So then what did everybody get to eat? Well, as I said, there's no eating of animals by people and no people eating of, of animals, okay? So that means everybody was vegetarian, everything. In fact, isn't that what God says? And God said, all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures move along the ground, everything that has a life of it, I give you every green plant for food. So, but you're going to say, well, Mr. Olstorn, uh, don't these teeth indicate that these creatures ate meat? Right? I mean, doesn't that what they're for? Well, what about every creature, including a lion? You mean lions ate vegetables? <laughs> How, what kind of lion is that? Okay. Well, that would be a good question, right? So, so let's look at these sharp teeth. How many, what kind of a creature is this? It's got sharp teeth. So it must eat meat, right? What kind of a creature is that? Any idea? Monkey? monkey? Um, no, sorry. No, it's not a monkey. That is correct. That is correct. It's a bear. So do bears eat vegetables and fruits? Absolutely they do. Now they can also eat meat, but uh, so what? So here we have another creature. Look at those sharp, long teeth in the front. Any ideas what that is? No, it's actually a fruit bat. Guess what fruit bats eat? <laughs> That's a tough one, isn't it? <laughs> Okay, how about this creature here? This is a ferocious looking, look at the teeth on it. I mean, that must be a real ferocious meat eating. What kind of creature it is? You'll, you, anybody guess? A what? Mouse? Mouse? Fish. Well, no, it's a chihuahua. <laughs> That's right, a chihuahua. That's right. I have to admit that any dog smaller than a cat, not really a dog. <laughs> it's, a, it's a mutant thing. I hope I don't offend anybody who has these things that yap all the time, and every time they pass me in the road, they always want to bite my head off. But other than that, I digress. So, and what about this creature? Fearsome. Look at the fangs on this thing. saber tooth tiger, you might say. Mm, not quite. Anything? You don't want to run into one of these in the forest because it's got pretty vicious fangs, right? Any ideas? No? Okay. This is called the Chinese water deer. Chinese water deer. Yeah. Really ferocious. Right? Maybe Santa used one of those in the front of the sled, you know, to keep all the other dinosaurs, I mean, the other uh, deer in line. But anyway, so 
obviously, having these fangs doesn't necessarily mean that they ate meat. Okay, in fact, in the Creation magazine, if you were to subscribe to one and you get that magazine, which we're going to mention, uh, there was a lion that was chronicled about that actually refused to eat meat. It only ate vegetables. In fact, uh, uh, the uh, article would say that the, uh, one of the most able zoo curators apparently said this lioness was the best of her species he had ever viewed. So it wasn't that this animal just surviving, but it was actually one of the best uh, examples of a lioness by eating vegetables. It was in the den with Daniel and... <laughs> yeah, it was a variant of the lions wearing the, 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 the vegetarian. Yeah, kind of deflates the story a little bit, doesn't it? But anyhow, I don't know where you got your theology from, Pastor, but uh, don't get it from me, okay? So, so... Of course, eating of meat and stuff has to do with enzymes. And so some of these enzymes can be switched off and on, and that allows some of the, um, the eating of foods that wouldn't normally be eaten by these creatures. And uh, so, of course, having straight teeth without fangs indicates they can't eat meat, right? Yeah, of course. So the teeth shape has nothing really to do with whether you can eat meat or not. So, well, then, if they were all vegetarians, what happened? Well, of course, Adam brought death into the world, and, but, of course, that also got them kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And uh, so whereas all the dinosaurs had been in great shape, they were living in harmony with each other, it didn't last very long. And then, of course, they started to fight and kill each other, just like Cain killed his brother Abel. Right? In fact, we have here actually a dinosaur in mortal combat where a raptor-like creature, raptor uh, here, okay, has its claws on the crest of a ceratopsian or crested dinosaur. So this was in mid-battle. Obviously, the, it was, the thing was voraciously hungry, and it was in battle, and then it came, somehow, it was engulfed in something that buried it and turned them into fossils in short order, right? So it was in, like, almost instantly. It didn't crush these fossils. Notice this. It didn't crush these creatures. It somewhat entombed the creatures in some kind of like a liquid with some, a lot of you know, clays and some sort of chemicals in there. And then it hardened. And then, the, of course, the, then it turned into fossils. Well, then what happened to all the dinosaurs? That's a good question, right? I mean, did the dinosaurs die off on an asteroid? Why an asteroid impact? Well, that's what we're told. That an asteroid impact 65 million years ago hit somewhere in Mexico, and then it created all the shock waves that killed all the dinosaurs. But strangely enough, it left all the other reptiles. Okay, the alligators, and somehow they managed to survive. How come they survived and the dinosaurs? Not really, uh, you know, a good explanation there. But we know the real reason dinosaurs died out. Okay. Right. Kids, pay attention. Okay, uh, that is actual joke. Okay, so oftentimes for kids they have these cartoon uh, arcs. Well, yeah, we won't show any books which has this depiction, and things like this. Where how do you get these huge dinosaurs on the ark? Right, it doesn't make any sense. Well, first of all, how big was this ark? Well, answers in Genesis in Fredericksburg, Kentucky, actually built a full size one. Anybody been there? Nobody's been there? Oh, you have to go. Okay, so it's a full-size ark. It is massive. One of the largest uh, wooden structures in the, in, in the United States. Okay, the ramp is along the side. is the ramp to bring the animals up to the door on the side of the ark. Pictures of the inside. Here's an inside. Uh, and pens and, and uh, how they would have put food on, uh, provided food for all the animals and all that other stuff, the logistics of putting animals on the ark. Well, sometimes people say, well, we're coming to dinosaurs in a minute, but how many animals? As people say, well, the ark wasn't big enough to carry all the species of animals on, on the earth. I mean, there's literally millions of species of animals. We're going to get them all on the ark. And why did he bring Mosquitoes. I don't. That uh, oh, could have solved a lot of problems then, right? But how? Well, what was the size of the ark? What was the capacity? Well, it had the capacity of about 520 railroad cars. Okay, that's jammed up. And if you had 240 sheep on each car, you'd have 200. Well, you'd have 120, 124,800 very unhappy sheep, I would say. But anyway, that was the capacity. But actually, how many animals needed to go on the ark? So Dr. John Woodrum Thorpe did a research study 
on look at every aspect of the ark. Food, light, waste, uh, heat, all that stuff. And he wrote a book out there. It's a brown book about this thick. And Answers in Genesis actually used a lot of that information for their ark and uh, the, the, for all the displays. But only about 16,000 animals were needed to go on the ark, not millions of species. Because you only needed to bring, because God created animals to reproduce according to their kinds, not according to the species. You see, so we have, for example, uh, Charles Darwin saw a whole bunch of finches in Galapagos Islands. They're all variants of the same finches. So, but you don't have to bring every variant along. You just need to bring an archetype, an original type from which all the others can descend. Even evolutionist creationists believe that there were original two archetypal dogs, probably like a gray wolf, from which all the other dogs descended, including those mutant ones, which are <coughs> cat size. Okay? So all of that... So it, this is a known part of natural selection. It works. It don't have no problem with it. But you only need about 16 kinds. For example, 16, uh, two cat kinds. And, uh, but then the question related to dinosaurs, how many dinosaur kinds were there? Well, so people have studied this and said there's actually, there's a number of things that we need to realize. And some non-Christian, non-creationist scientists have said one of the things that he suspects, Jack Horner suspects, is that dinosaurs went through this shape-shifting thing, okay? So dinosaurs got to live a fairly long lifespan, and as they grew, they actually changed shape to a certain degree. Funny adults seem to do that as well, you know? But so the first dinosaur on the left, they would have given it a particular name. Then they would find an older one. Somebody else would give it another name because of the guy who found it. And the third one, somebody else would give it another name. They thought they were all three different dinosaurs, but actually they were the same kind. So that could explain, like, for example, the crested dinosaur, the ceratopsia. So these are all examples of the same kind. They just happen to be at different growth rates or ages. And they have different kinds of uh, antlers coming out of their heads, et cetera, and crest, et cetera. But they're all the same kind of dinosaur. So you need to bring on two of this ceratopsian. And so you only would have maybe needed about 60 different kinds or 120 dinosaurs. But then you say, well, how are you going to get those big monsters on the ark? Well, that's a good question. You're definitely not going to do it this way. Okay. So we have this ark, huge monstrous boat, and you have, well, that's a sauropod dinosaur. How do you get that on the ark? Well, why would you bring the massive ones, the adult ones, right? If they started out with this size, with an egg, why don't you bring a young one? You know, it was only like a little, little dog, a normal dog size, okay? Bring one, a pair like that size, and then it would fit on the ark. And they have a long life ahead of them to grow and to mature and to reproduce. Well, with the, power, with the use of PowerPoint, we can make that happen. Look at that. We can shrink that, and we had, uh, you know, Tyrannosaurus rex will just shrink that into small-sized juveniles, and they can go on the ark. That would account for that, okay? Yeah, trying to bring on the mass of big ones is not going to work, but uh, juveniles certainly would work. And uh, when the flood was happening, as the waters were coming up onto the land in great tsunami, those animals would have been herding farther as, as the waters are rising, they would try and be going to higher lands. Now, the humans would have probably gone up to the mountain to get out of the water, but the dinosaurs can't do this. So they were going more and more inland, and that's exactly what we see in the United States, where we see tracks of animal dinosaurs all heading in the same direction, away from the waters that are rising. And, of course, you, they, as the water is getting up by their feet, they're creating mud, and they're leaving imprints, which then become fossilized, and that's why you see fossil dinosaur fossil footprints. Okay, now this, I don't know, this comes from some Disney movie, so I don't exactly know. Anyway, it gives you some idea of the catastrophe that was unfolding uh, as the floodwaters were rising. Some of the other things we also see are these very unique characteristics. You'll see this curve in the neck. Okay, so this is a sauropod, a long-necked long dinosaur. And so you can imagine this thing would have been walking along, and rather than the head being all far up, I was talking to a paleontologist at the uh, Royal Tyrell Museum. They believed that they, the dinosaurs had their necks went out long way, right? Not up, but they went out long ways, balanced by the tail, which also went to give counterbalance to their long neck. So they're walking along. One of them has a heart attack. Oof. And so they sit there, and they just lie there and then they would just die and decay. 
But this, is, this doesn't happen here. What happened here to this one? Okay, something happened. Well, this is what they believe is a result of asphyxia, and not a, a, an automatic reaction when the brain is deprived of oxygen, that the neck cranes back like this into this arch. And this is typical of these type of dinosaurs you see, which indicates that they were buried alive. And then they died, rigor mortis set in, and then they were fossilized. Hmm. What could cause that? Well, if, obviously, if they were entombed in water in a flood, and then they were moving along, and they got buried, still alive. Obviously, it must have happened very, very instantly, because otherwise, if they had just simply died, then they wouldn't have arched this neck. But is there any other evidence that dinosaurs are relatively young age? Well, yes. In 2005, a Dr. Mary Schweitzer found some going through an unfossilized Tyrannosaurus rex bones, which means they didn't turn to rock. They were just like dead animal bones. And she found some of this material. This is organic material. It's uh, flexible, resilient, and stretch returned to its original shape. Uh, I'll talk more about that in the next lecture. But so dinosaur organic material she found. So if it, she said it was like modern samples. How do you explain that? And uh, if it, you know, if forensic science, this is exactly what they look at. They look at this organic material and they say, well, how old does it like to be? She says it looks fresh, coming from a T-Rex bones. So that would indicate that these are young bones not 65 million year old bones because there's no way that organic material can last that horrendous amount of time. So this would speak to dinosaurs living out relatively recently. And um, okay, so we'll talk a bit more about that a little bit more in the next lecture. But what about dinosaurs? Don't we, why don't we see, if dinosaurs were so you know, uh, significant creatures, why don't we see them mentioned in the Bible? Why don't we see dinosaurs? Now, we do have some behemoth and, and uh, leviathan mentioned in the book of Job. Exactly what they were, we don't know. We can't pin them down. But obviously, they were ferocious creatures, possibly dinosaurs, possibly a large marine reptile. But the reason why we don't see dinosaurs and the word dinosaur in the Bible, because it wasn't coined until after the Bible was written. I mean, the King James Version was written in 1611. And the uh, word dinosaur only came into existence in 1841 coined by Sir, Fred, Sir Richard Owen of the British Museum. So obviously you can't have a word if it isn't invented yet. But they, people did see dinosaur-like creatures. Uh, what do you think they called them? Dragons. That is, who said that? You were here the last lecture. Well, yeah, I, yeah, I remembered something. OK, good, good. <laughs> I made a lasting impression. OK. <laughs> So here we have, and Vance Nelson has this book out there, Dragons, a coffee table book. A lot of these come in there. So this is a jade um, single horn pterostopsium. Of course, they didn't put their names on it. But somebody, 2000 BC, carved out of jade a creature that looked an awful lot like a dinosaur. And in Mesopotamia, they have the cylinder seal where you roll it along clay. It makes these impressions in the clay. And the creature looks like a Taniostrifus. Trophius, okay, another dinosaur-like creature. And in Angkor Wat in uh, Cambodia, one of the oldest uh, uh, religious uh, monuments, there, uh, well, that's obviously no longer in use. The gardener gave up quite a while ago. And, uh, but there are some carving, some release in the pillars. And uh, actually, a coworker of mine actually went there in Cambodia, and he took some pictures, not the pictures I'm showing you, but look at this creature. What does that look like? So this guy who went, my guy named Mark, he said, oh, no, no, it's not a dinosaur. He's an atheist, right? He doesn't believe in God. It's not a dinosaur. It's uh, some stylized hippo or something like that. But I had it at my desk at work, and this, another guy named Guy came along. I said, Guy, what do you think this looks like? Oh, stegosaurus. So a lot of this has to do with what you want to see, right? The big question is, do you want to see a stegosaurus? there or not. Right? And if you say, no, the stegosaurus did not live contemporaneous to 800 years ago, right, 12th, 12th century. No, it's not possible. So therefore, whatever it is, it isn't a stegosaurus, even though this guy drew what somebody else recognized as a stegosaurus. 
And in England, they have in the Carlisle Cathedral, they buried people in the, in the floor, even in, the, in uh, Westminster Abbey. They actually have Charles Darwin him buried in the floor in Westminster Abbey. <laughs> I went there. So. But uh, so in some of the surrounds of this Bishop Carlisle in the, uh, in the bronze, they have these, these creatures that are in the bronze, which look an awful lot like a sauropod dinosaur. Now, does it prove that they were there at the time? No. But it suggests that people were seeing something, right? They didn't have the internet. They didn't have a lot of books that they could refer to. They had something that was in memory that people could refer to. And, uh, uh, you know, it's something like a dinosaur. Maybe people saw these type of dinosaurs. And uh, dragons, the w dragons have been around all over the world. Dragon legends in China. And, of course, we have Sir George, St. George slew the dragon. What did he salute, slay? What was the legend about? Right? Was it a dog? Was it a cat? Was it a lion he saw? Or was it a dinosaur of some kind? And of course, the flag of Wales also has a dragon motif. And one last thing is Marco Polo. Marco Polo is an Italian explorer. He just didn't play games in the swimming pool. So, <laughs> so he, uh, you know, he went to, uh, from Italy overland, rather than overseas, some of the other one, overland to uh, China, and he chronicled some of his journeys and things that he saw along the way. And here is one of his chronicles, the second journey. He says, I'll just read the text in yellow. Here are seen huge serpents, about 30 feet long. Jaws are wide enough to swallow a man. The teeth are large and sharp, and their whole appearance is so formidable that neither man nor any kind of animal can approach them without terror. Now listen to this. Whatever beast they meet with and can lay hold of, whether tiger, wolf, or any other, they devour. What kind of a creature can devour tigers? An elephant? Hippopotamus? No known creature that we see today eats tigers. Tigers eat everything else, right? So obviously what he was referring to was some kind of a creature. Thankfully, we don't have too many of them going around today, but could it have been a dinosaur that he saw? It's possible. All right, so how can you get further information? I'm giving you a lot of stuff. You're not going to remember all this stuff, but you can get further information by the resource that we have in the table, but also through Creation Magazine. This is one of the things we encourage people to support a ministry with and to get resources. This is a resource. I'm going to get Creation Magazine. Okay, so we can sign all the rest of you up. Perfect. All right. So it builds faith. It answers questions. teaches how science supports scripture, but also a very important point. It inoculates against evolution. Because part of the problem is, is that young people who aren't exposed to any kind of creation science teaching, and they hear something about the Bible, you got God created in six days, and then they go into high school and university, and they start presenting all this evolutionary information, and they have nothing to counter it. It just blows them away. And that's why many of them said, well, I don't know, Christianity doesn't seem to have any answers to all these questions, because they never heard it. And that's why organizations like ours, Creation Ministry International, exist. And in order to get your children this type of information, we recommend that you get Creation Magazine. It comes up four times a year, and it's, uh, it's, it's suitable for all ages. It's not heavy technical. We actually have a technical journal, Journal of Creation, that's the PhD level. But, so it's our number one equipping tool, and it's on a subscription basis kind of like Netflix or some other uh, subscription you have. It's $7.50 every three months, like uh, Tim Hortons three times a, a, a once a month or for three months. Anyway, you get a hard copy, a real physical magazine. You can get it on digital devices up to five. You can share it among people. And then uh, you also get a free, if you sign up today, tonight, you get a free issue of a magazine worth $7.50, and you also get a free DVD worth $14. So you get $22.50 worth of, of resources for signing up for, one, for the first year, okay? And it'll be ongoing for $30. So I think it's a very, very good deal, and you don't have to pay anything tonight. Great. Also, some other resources are Answers Book. So if you're looking for something to give to somebody, and there's, they have all kinds of questions, but not really wanting to get too deep into all of this stuff. This is a recommended resource. Uh, 60 of the most often asked questions on creation and evolution, including things like, where did Cain get his wife? You'll have to read the book. 
So there's also many resources on dinosaurs, and uh, so you can peruse that uh, there. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that ends the lecture. Thank you very much. So we're going to come back at what, 8.30? 15 minutes? Yeah, so at 8.30, if you're all in here, rather than having to pull in one by one, you know. So if you have to go, God bless you, but uh, buy a whole bunch of resources so we don't have to, on the way out. Thank you very much. See you in 15 minutes.
that little children have to go to bed. It's already 8.30, and boy, we don't want to get them past 11 o'clock. I mean, that would be very late. You have school tomorrow? Oh, man, school. Oh. It's better to re be retired. You get up when you want, go have breakfast, have a coffee. That's new. It, it's, I, I, you know, you get very busy. It's amazing how much stuff you do. You have to have a nap at about 4 o'clock for, you know, that's... Carbon dated. <laughs> That's not how the story goes. I was going to ask you how we could carbon date something because we have to carbon date his car. <laughs> <laughs> An antique, is it? Well, his legs stick out through the floorboard. Oh, I see. Yeah, I've had one of those myself, yes. But I repaired it, you know. But of course, Fred Flintstone, that's exactly the type of car he had, you know, through the floorboard. Great, save all kinds of fuel. I wonder if he used fossil fuels. <laughs> <coughs> Just kids. <laughs> Time delay. <laughs> okay. Amazing evidences for a young universe. Am I loud enough for you? So I don't have to yell here? Okay. So uh, I already told you about Croatian ministries. We're in uh, seven countries. Uh, more PhD scientists than other, Christi other Christian ministries. Uh, other, our information department reviews all the major science journals, and our speakers travel over can all over Canada, including myself. For the past uh, eight years, I've visited about 150 different churches, uh, some twice. Okay, the better ones I've visited twice. And uh, oh, yeah. we also do, <laughs> figure you're going to buy more stuff if I do that. So, weekly t t TV show. Uh, we have a full-fledged, there's so much resources on the creation.com website. We've got over 13,000 articles. I haven't read them all, but uh, there's been over 30 years putting stuff on there, updating it, material. Anything related to the creation and evolution question, okay, even origins of things like marriage and things like that, which touch on the Genesis, or you'll find articles in there. Some are in-depth, some are responsive to questions. There's also a daily update on an article on the creation.com. You can get it, subscribe to that. You get it on your uh, news feed. Okay, creation.com, very interesting. All right, well, as you know... We are told that the universe started about 13.8 billion years ago from an alleged Big Bang. And it wasn't a bang so much as an expansion from a singularity. How you got that singularity is a question that they don't answer. How you, because that singularity contained all the matter and mass and energy in the universe. That singularity, which is, who knows how big it was, very small, right? All it, so, but before that, there was nothing. Absolutely nothing. And somehow they say it became something and it expanded into the universe we have today. That largely comes from uh, the expansion of the universe. I'll talk a little bit about the Big Bang towards the end because there's a problem with that. Uh, but this is the current theory that is being taught. And even Christian apologists are using this, saying that God used the Big Bang to create the life on Earth today. Of course, that's not exactly what the Bible says, is it? The Bible does tell us that about 6,000 years ago, God had made everything in six days, and then about 15, 1,600 years after that, uh, there was a global flood in Noah's day, which wiped out all the, everybody that lived on the earth, except for the people who were on the ark. There were eight in them, eight of uh, all, including Noah and three sons. And we are all descendant of the three sons of uh, Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Okay. So... We do have an issue, of course, related to the rock strata. This is usually when people think in terms of deep time for the Earth, or the Earth has spent you know, billions of years old. It's because they look at the rocks, the sedimentary rocks, not the igneous, ig metamorphic or igneous rocks. They look at the sedimentary rocks, and they say, well, in the, igne in the sedimentary rocks, we have all these layers. And these layers contain fossils. Well, fossils are dead animals. And if the sedimentary rocks took two billion years to accumulate, that means that the animals that died in there are of corresponding age. So if the bottom is two billion years old, anything that lived at the bottom was two billion years old. Things that lived at the top would have been, of course, more recent age. So that's what they say gives us this whole idea of evolution and deep time. But it relies on certain assumptions. And we'll talk a bit about that. So obviously there was death and disease and pain and extinction. This is all 
what we see in the fossil record. We talked about cancers and things and broken bones that these creatures had. And of course, when they died, they were all jumbled up together. And uh, it, it was a catastrophe of the highest order. But some people say, well, maybe this is what God did. God used evolution to bring us here today. In fact, some very high profile Christians are doing this, even in evangelical universities. So they're saying that God used things like evolutionary creationism, the idea that God had used evolution, but it provides some very powerful or uh, challenging questions or problems. Because if this method of evolution in which things died and were buried and, uh, you know, re endlessly over billions of years, that means there would have been a lot of suffering, billions of creatures, who would be responsible for that? That's the theological question. If God used this pro process of trial and error to get us eventually... Who would be responsible for all the death and disease and suffering? Well, if theistic evolutionists will have to conclude that it was God who brought all of this death and disease and suffering into the universe. In fact, laying it also at the feet of Jesus Christ, who in the Bible tells us is in fact the creator of the universe. All things were made by him and without him nothing was made that has been made. So are you trying to tell me then that this person who claims to be the savior of the world is also the one who, who, who brought this death and disease and suffering over billions of years on, in the first place? How can he be a savior if he's the one who brought the problem? How can we call him a savior if we then... And this is the problem, okay, with trying to say that Jesus or God had brought, used evolution. There are other problems as well, including, you know, Jesus, you know, all these key significant events in the Old Testament, Adam and Eve creation, the global flood, Jesus affirmed all of these as real, historical people, places, and events. These were not myths, these were not allegories. Jesus believed that these were real People and events, etc. The apostles also believe that as well. That's what they taught. In fact, the church up till recently has also taught that. There are some who say, no, no, they didn't. Well, actually, that's not true. There's plenty of records which showing if they did err on the age question, let's say for creation week, it was on why did God take so long? Why did God take six days? If he's almighty, why did he bother... Six whole days to do it all? He could have just spoke and it was all done at once. Poof, Adam was there. He wouldn't have known the difference, would he? If it had taken six days earlier, if it happened just one second before his, his awareness. Why did it take God six days? All right, so God did take six days, that's what he said. And it was, we talked about it, it was all very good. And this is sort of a repeat what we had before. So again, where are we going to have to put all that... Uh, fossils, if, the, if we put all those fossils before Adam and Eve, then it means that it wasn't good. It was a lot of bad before it was good, and then it became bad, which doesn't make sense biblically. Or, and of course, then, of course, we believe that all of this bad is fossils and sediment, and all the fossils, including the dinosaurs, all happened post-creation or after creation or within the last 6,000 years, which is what we're going to look at as what is the scientific evidence to justify that, that all of this activity took place within recent times, not over millions of years. So just to remember, the scenario is, it was very good, Adam sinned, then it wasn't very good, then death and bad things entered, and the fossils and all the strata, etc., are a consequence of that. Theistic evolution, progressive creationism, the gap theory, evolutionary creationism, and every other scheme that forces millions of years and evolution onto the Genesis narrative denies that Adam's sin brought death into the world and thus, ren and thus renders meaningless Jesus' death as the payment for Adam's sin and for ours also. Because if it was because of Adam's sin that we are cursed, we're going to have death, and it's only through Jesus Christ that we can have life, which is what the gospel is, if there was no Adam, then what did Jesus come to do? Exactly, if there was no animal. I think atheists understand this sometimes better than Christians. And this particular guy, Frank Zindler, in a debate with William Lane Craig, said this, if there never was an Adam and Eve, there never was an original sin. 
If there never was an original sin, there was no need of salvation. If there was no need of salvation, there was no need of a savior. And I submit that puts Jesus, historical otherwise, into the ranks of the unemployed. I think that evolution is absolutely the death knell of Christianity. And it has been very effective. In fact, uh, Christian Ministry International put together this pamphlet. They gave one to the pastor and I uh, have a few of them, which uh, looks at why people are leaving the church. And it might not be but think it, it, a lot of it has to do with science, not moral issues, okay, that many would think. So, for example, 70% of youth across all Christian denominations indicate they strongly agree that the teachings of science and religion often ultimately conflict with each other. In other words, what they're told about science and what they understand about the scriptures, they believe are in conflict with each other. We don't think they are, but if you come from an evolutionary scenario, then yes, they will be. So either you have to jettison the Bible if you're going to keep evolution, or you have to get rid of evolution if you're going to keep the Bible. It's one or the other. And uh, nearly all American youth associate science with evidence and proof, but associate religion with blind faith and private subjective opinion. In other words, they don't see it as science versus science. They believe that if it's religious, therefore it's subjective and it has no basis in objective reality. But we don't, we don't believe that that's true. In fact, the framers, those who actually started modern science, didn't believe that either. Guys like Newton and Boyle and Kepler and all these fathers of modern science were Bible-believing Christians. In fact, even atheists will agree, and historians of sciences will, science will agree, that it was because of the Judeo-Christian worldview that gave rise to modern science. How so? Because Judeo-Christian worldview gave the idea that God had put order into the universe, order and meaning and purpose, which we could discover. So we were thinking God's thoughts after him. So we're trying to figure out if God put order and meaning into the universe, then we should be able to discover it. And in fact, that's exactly what modern science is about. How does it all work? How does genetics work? How does chemistry work? How does physics work? All the stuff, we're finding it out. And every time we uncover another la layer, we find there's more layers underneath, particularly in genetics. Okay, people talk about their DNA this is long past DNA. There's so much more going on. Uh, epigenetics, and uh, frankly, if it's I can't see with the naked eye, it's kind of beyond me. I'm more up in the air type of guy, you know. So if I can see it, I like it. But so, but there's so much complexity. To think that all of this could happen somehow by accident is like trying to assemble a Boeing 747 from a junkyard as a tornado goes through it. It's, it's, it's ludicrous to think that, but that's what they're told. Yes, just have evolution, we'll do it, it puts things together, blah, blah, time and chance is all that's needed, and you have what we have today. And you have to buy that. Otherwise, you're probably not going to have a job in a university, unfortunately. The good news is that organizations like ours, Creation Ministry International, have the answer or provide you with the answer. So you need to equip yourselves with the answer. And how can you do it? I'm going to ask for the clipboards to be ready. Okay. okay. So we have uh, lots of resources. Uh, they're in most of them in Ontario. I have even some in my home for local talks. We have over 400 published resources. I haven't read most of them. Okay, 13,000 articles on the website, PhD scientists on staff. In fact, there is a Egypt tour, which my wife and I are going on the end of August with some of those scientists. Uh, 3,000 events in Canada since 2020, uh, 2000, and a lot of other stuff that you can uh, make available, even free videos, and the resources, some of the resources, although we have it in print here, they're also available in digital version, Kindle, and uh, that you can get as well. So one of the things we recommend, if you are in want to keep abreast of what's going on in the ministry, we have our Infobytes. And all you need to do is put, it comes out weekly, it's an email, it just puts your name and email address in English, and uh, put your postal code and hand the clipboards back to the next people that have to go to the back row. Okay, so that'll get you signed up and uh, keep you aware of what's going on. Dust. Yes, sir. If we've already signed up for that, we're going to continue. To yes. We don't need to sign up. Correct. Account. Correct. This is for you. If you haven't signed up for InfoBytes, uh, this is where you need to sign up. Okay. So we at CMI are convinced that the Holy Scriptures are inerrant and infallible and can be understood without special knowledge or education. 
In fact, isn't that exactly what the Reformation brought about? The idea that you didn't need a priest to interpret the scriptures. You, in fact, could interpret the scriptures on your own. Now, that presents some potential problems, but isn't that exactly what the Paul uh, applauded the Bereans for doing? Or saying, you didn't just take my word for it, you actually went to the scriptures to see if what I was teaching you was actually scriptural. And so this is what we believe, believe that you could, an ordinary person with you know, a competent uh, you know, understanding of scriptures, could decide what the scriptures actually teach. We are also convinced that God's word trumps man's word. In other words, that because God made everything, he would know what actually took, transpired at creation. We're looking, trying to look back in time and then trying to figure it out. But we weren't there. God was there. What did he say? This is what we go by. Not by somebody's speculation about what happened. Now, when it comes to the whole question of age of things, like rocks, strata, and fossils, etc., it's not as if we have evolutionists, creationists have different facts. It's not like we have different fossils. It's not like the creation fossils and evolution fossils. They're just fossils. Okay? So what you have is we have the same facts, but it depends on our worldview in how you interpret the facts, how you interpret the fossils. How long does it take to make a fossil? Well, if you're an evolutionist, it's going to take a very long time. If you're a creationist, it cannot take a long time. And uh, so ev the, the naturalist or the, the uh, evolutionist is constrained by purely natural processes. They cannot invoke at any time supernatural processes. And they say that science is all about natural processes. But not why. Why cannot supernatural processes be invoked in the study of origins? Why must it only be natural processes? This is not coming from science itself. It's a philosophy that's imposed upon it. You see, so that's a bit of a problem. So, the thing in, 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 in science, at least in regards to the past, is uniformitarianism, uniformitarianism principle, the idea that what we see happening today has always been happening. So as the continents slowly drift apart, they've always been slowly drifting apart. And how do we know this? We don't. We cannot know this. This is simply an assumption on their part. Okay? However, creationist says, yes, we believe in there are natural processes that God made, the world, but every now and then, or in certain circumstances, there are supernatural processes, such as the creation of the world is a supernatural event. The creation week, everything was not by natural process, so science, you know, naturalistic science cannot ever discover any of this. We have to take God's word that, of what he did. Okay, such as placing the stars in the heavens, etc. This is all supernatural process. This is obviously a faith statement. This is not something that we get undiscovered to science because it's not scientific. It's supernatural. Spelled above that. Okay. So let's look at some of the science aspects. So we look at things that I um, pick some of the things which we are familiar with and which often used to suggest the Europe world is millions and billions of years old, such as sedimentary rock fossilization, uh, crystals, etc. Uh, we're going to touch a bit on the Big Bang at the end, because that's a bit of a problem. So let's look at strati stratigraphy, or the layers of rock. Anybody been to Grand Canyon? It's a Grand Canyon. It is a, if, you ever have, if you ever have a chance, I like to go, it is awesome. I've been from the south side, the north side actually flew over it with a twin-engine plane. It's, 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 it's grand. <laughs> very long and very deep. So they will tell you that this canyon took two billion years for the layers to, to accumulate to what they have at the top. It's about 7,000 feet above sea level. Okay? And uh, they said, how, well, how did, that, how did it accumulate? Well, every year there was a, a layer of water that brought this little layer of sand and that deposited. Next year there was another layer. Next year to another layer. Okay, repeat, repeat. Well, if you only have little layers of sand, sand, it's going to take an awful long time to accumulate all those layers, and that's how they get the, these billions of years. And they say, well, what about the canyon itself? What, how did the canyon get carved out? Well, they say that little river at the bottom, the Colorado River, it's a small river and compared to the canyon. So they ask the question, how long would it take the Colorado River to carve this canyon? Well, a little river is going to take a little bit. It's going to take an awful long time to carve the canyon. But is that the right question? Hmm. 
You know, the other thing is that they say that the strata, these rock layers, are showing geological time. So at the very bottom, you're going to have, you know, what they say is that the Precambrian, Cambrian levels, you're going to have all the earliest creatures that were evolved from, from non-living things, slowly became living, and so the most simple creatures. Well, they're not really simple creatures. In fact, even in the, pre in the Cambrian explosion, which they believe is billions of years old, several billions of years old, they're fully formed creatures. They're not simple creatures. They're not transitional forms. They're fully formed creatures. Well, then how do you go from non-living to fully formed? Instantly. Well, that'd be a miracle, but of course they won't acknowledge the miracle. But maybe the view of this geological column, which actually doesn't really exist, it's more theoretical. You can't go in the world and find this, these layers uh, of rock. It's assumed. And it's assumed by the index fossils. If you go to stratigraphy.org, where they have all of this for scientists, they look at how do you know how old that layer is? Well, you know the layer age is by the fossil that it contains. And how, old do, how, do, how do you know how old the fossil is? By the rock layer that it's in. <laughs> so this is a tautology, this is circular reasoning. Right? And that's, that's exactly how it works. So it doesn't really matter where on the planet it is. If you find this particular fossil, index fossil, you date that layer, even if it's on the surface. Okay, because that, that would mean that the material had been removed above that and only exposed a layer 100 million years old or several million years old. That's why they look at, you know, supposed hominid fossils or fossils of alleged human. Uh, if they find it on the surface, they look at what's the, what's the dating of this layer. And if the layer is dated by index fossils to 3 million years, they think that that is a 3 million year old tooth, even though it's sitting on the surface of the rock. It's strange. <clears throat> Okay, don't have to remember that, but all you need to know is that they believe this took several billion years in which to form. So let's look a, look a little deeper into this canyon issue. So here's some of the canyons in the Antelope X Canyon in, in uh, Arizona. My wife and I went traveled through there. We actually drove from Montreal to Salt Lake City and down through the canyons and then back through. I would say there's a lot of nothing in between <laughs> Montreal and Colorado. So once you've seen what's over here, that's what it is in prairies. So my wife and I went uh, there, and here's uh, some of those layers, the sedimentary layers. I'm the guy on the right. And uh, <laughs> so if you look close at the varves, these are these fine sediments are called varves. And they're very, very fine layers. So how did those layers, evolution will tell you, well, over billions of these little layers were laid out by annual deposits of, of sediment, of water-borne sediment. But these sediment, now the sedimentary layers cover 75 to 90% of the Earth's surface. Sedimentary rocks, they're all over the place. So that means that, and some of these layers go on, these rock strata will go across continents. So they were imagining that an annual layer of water would lay down across the continent. I don't know, I, I, this is kind of year after year after year. After, yeah, keep going, going, but we don't have millions of years. So... So is that, did anybody ever see that? No, nobody ever saw that. So that's just imagine. But is there any way that we can actually demonstrate how these layers are made? Well, actually we can. University experiment is showing how you can, through the flow of water carrying sediments or sed material, as you can see, by varying the flow rate, you can get different sedimentary layers. You see that, well, you can see some of them here, obviously here, right? See this layer here? Right? And all these different layers along here. Okay. So all these layers, just like you would on the, on the, the, rock, the mountains or on the canyon, we can actually do this in the laboratory. Hmm. Well, then it obviously doesn't take millions of years okay, in order for this to happen. But is there anything else? Well, let's take a look at this. This is one of the canyons, Antelope X Canyon, I believe it's called, uh, or Deer Creek Trail. <laughs> So when you actually look at these number of layers, there's about one foot based just by the age and the depth or the thickness. So you get about one foot or 30 centimeters of these layers in about 300,000 years by the evolutionary reckoning. I mean, that's a long time. It's a very slow process. Well, if you're doing paper thin every year, yeah, it's going to take an awful long time. But it's what you don't see, which I believe is most telling. 
what you don't see. So that presupposes that you had a nice thin layer brought by water year after year after hundreds of thousands of years. But as you well know, weather doesn't work like that. You often have storms. You have thunderstorms. You have tornadoes. Even Montreal, Ottawa are tornadoes. I mean, these things happen every now. What we don't see is any evidence of erosion. How is that possible? Hundreds of thousands of years of layers and no evidence of any erosion or cracks. You would have seen that in the strata. You would have seen evidence of erosion. What also you don't see is you don't see any vegetation. You don't see any roots. How, how's that possible? I mean, there's nothing lived and grew over 300, over billion years? And then you also don't see any animal track, any burrowing of animals that go through the mud and things like that. It's like, it's like these layers were built up all of a sudden without time for you know, burrowing or erosion or something like that. And that's exactly what we believe happened. Okay? This is not evidence of long period of time. This is evidence of the flood of Noah making all the strata as vo vast volumes of water bringing dirt and debris and sand, etc., laying them all out like that a, a laboratory experiment over, well, majority of the earth because it was a global flood. So another evidence is Mount St. Helens. So Mount St. Helens is a dormant volcano that lives at, that is in southeastern uh, Washington state. In 1980, it literally blew its top off, 1,600 times the force of the Hiroshima atomic bomb. The force was astronomical. And it blew trees flat 10 miles. Some people were taking photos, thought, well, it's not going to affect me. They're still there. Okay. And I, so the material that came literally the top, you see people here, the, literally the top blew off. And it melted all the snow. It's a snow-capped mountain year-round. And it take all that in what they call pyroclastic flows, lava and mud and water, down the mountain into this area here. You can barely see here the layer. There's, there's trees, uh, remains of trees in this lake. Okay, And uh, so all of this material, about up to 600 feet thick, 200 meters thick of material went down the mountain. Two years later, there was another eruption. You see the little dome in the middle here, which also sent mud and debris, etc., down the mountain and carved a canyon in what was laid down two years earlier. So here you can see the material. You can see the outlines here of the material that was laid down in 1980. Okay, and we know this because it was seen. People saw this, and this canyon here was created in 1982. Now, if you didn't know this historical event, you just happened to be across, coming across this canyon, you and your uh, Martha are then, Martha, we got us here a canyon, right? How long does it take that canyon to form? Well, you say, well, how long does it take that little river there to form that canyon? Well, you say it's a little, can it's a little river, only takes a little bit of mud and debris out of, at a time. It's going to take millions of years. But you're going to be wrong because it was, that's not the right question. It was the river did not carve the canyon it was the mud flow in 1982 that came down. And we know this because it was observed. Okay. So it's also interesting to note that if we look at closer zoom at the area here, this is what the picture is of. Notice all the strata. This all was laid down in 1980 and exposed in 1982. If you didn't know that, you would come along and say, well, how long did it take to accumulate all these layers of rock here? Well, it would have taken a very thin layer over millions and millions of years. But it happened since most of us were alive. <laughs> we're born, right? Now, this is observed scientific evidence. When somebody said the Grand Canyon was formed over 2 billion years, it's not observed. It's just assumed. So I'm saying, suggesting that the science, observed science, is actually on the side of the biblical account, not on the evolutionary account. Now, most people don't know that or see that because most people are not even exposed to that. That's where you come in. So now that you know this, you can then share with other people. How can you share with people? Well, there's an excellent DVD called the Genesis, is Genesis History. Uh, it's, it's, we sell it here, it's also available on Netflix. But uh, excellent DVD. They're building another sequence, uh, Del Thackett on it, uh, excellent, so it's on, part of it's on YouTube. 
There's also a DVD we have on Mount St. Helens. You can take this to somebody and give them saying, you know, all that rock layers, well, this will show you how it can be formed in, since 1980. Okay. There's more, we don't have time for that. Um, so the flood would have drastically altered the Earth's surface, moved enormous amounts of material, and distributed this around the world in used deposits of sedimentary layers. So now you have enough force, we have enough water, we have enough debris, and it would have done, created all of the sedimentary layer around the world. That's one of the reasons why we believe that the flood of Noah was global, because the results of the flood, the sedimentary layers, are global. Some people argue that the flood was local in the Black Sea area. That doesn't make sense. Why bother? Right? When you think about it, why bother having a flood just in the Black Sea area? If Noah has given something like 80 years to build an ark, why didn't he just say, forget the ark, I'm just walking? Right? <laughs> and why wouldn't the animals just walk away? You can go a long distance in 80 years. Well out of it. But also God had said, didn't God say by putting a rainbow in the sky, I will never send a flood to cover the earth? If that is in fact was a local flood, as you well know, there's lots of local floods that have happened since then and are still happening. Was God lying? Which is basically what you'd have to admit, that the rainbow was not a sign of that there would never be a global flood because there's been lots of floods ever since. Hmm. Once you start down the road of compromising God's word, not taking it as written, you end up with all kinds of problems. Basically, what ends up, you end up discarding the entire Bible. If I can't take the creation account, if I can't take Adam, I can't take the resurrection, I can't take Christianity, I just give up on the whole thing. That's one of the reasons why people are leaving the faith and going to atheism or something else because they don't have the answers. And even in some Christians they go to, even in some evangelical universities, they're told, no, no, you believe in evolution. It's okay. But it's not okay. So here's some other events. These are, are syncline, synclines, I think they're called. And this is sedimentary layers that have bent like 90 degrees. How do you bend layers 90 degrees? This is solid rock. It's actually in Namibia. And you see this in other places as well. Like uh, we went in Flor Florian. Well, you were telling me about some of that as well. All over the world, you see these types of things. How do you bend sedimentary layers? Well, the only way they could bend is if they were not solid rock. Because if they were solid rock when they bent, you'd have fracturing, shattering of the rock. Compression and tension fractures happen all over the place. You would even have heating, which would lead to metamorphic rock. See, none of that. All you see is the layer is just bent as if it was some kind of a plasmic state which would make sense if it was all laid down during the flood period of Noah's day, this huge thick, and then you had some tectonic movement, some plate movement, which pushed some layers up and put some down, and that's what happened. It pushed these layers up. Okay? Flying, from, uh, flying from Vancouver to Kelowna, if you look out to the north, you will see some of the layers on the rock are like this. The Rocky Mountains are actually, the strata is pointing up to the sky. Take a look next time you fly in it. And uh, that's because this had been sheared, right? They've been sheared and lifted up by tectonic plates, okay? And the, whole, the whole system is lifted up. Here, it's been soft and it was all bent, okay? So obviously, there's some huge tectonic forces. These are plate forces that are going on and moving things around. It's indicated one that's been soft during the flood of Noah. Polystratic fossils. So here you have a tree fossil in uh, petrified wood. It's a rock. It's going through many layers of sedimentary rock. Now, if those sedimentary rocks took millions of years to form, how old would that tree have to be? <laughs> it would literally have to be millions of years old. Otherwise, it would have just died and decayed, and there wouldn't be anything left. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have kept on growing. So evolutionists would say, oh, no, no, the tree kept growing while the layers were slowly accumulating around it. Millions of years, tens of millions of years. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't, don't buy that. That doesn't make sense to me. What seems to happen is that there was a flood in which all these layers were made up by the flood of Noah, and these trees, some of the trees were mounted vertical in the, because of the roots were heavier, they're sitting vertical. They all were then compacted together, and they all turned to rock together. This makes more sense than simply million-year-old trees. 
Again, that would be totally against everything we know about science. Well, we talked about dinosaurs earlier, so I don't need a sentence. But let's ask the question about fossilization. How long does it take to turn something into a fossil? According to National Geographic, uh, preserved remains, in other words, an animal that died and was covered, uh, was not subject to uh, oxygen, which would have, uh, you know, uh, decayed it, uh, would take something like 10,000 years in, in order to form a fossil. That's what National Geographic, that's what kids are told. But we don't have 10,000 years to form fossils. But, so that would mean, though, is, is there any evidence that it happens a lot faster? Well, actually, even secular media was telling us, yes, here's a fossilized fern, fern which new scientists said almost instantly fossilized. This is not a creationist site. This is the new scientists that say this fern fossilized so fast that you can actually see cell division under a microscope. Now, anybody knows that if you have a plant and it dies, it starts to wilt and decay pretty quick. You could try this at home, kids. Take some cauliflower, okay, put it on the counter, and just see how long before it turns to, well, stuff that your mother's going to ask you to remove. But uh, so obviously, this must have happened very, very fast. You know, Charles Darwin himself said, you're never going to find a fossil of an invertebrate, a creature without a bone, without a backbone or bones. So he would, because he was assuming that fossilization took thousands of years, and of course, if it was just flesh, it would have decayed. Well, they've actually had fossils of octopus. This octopus was obviously no bones in it, and it became a fossilized almost instantly. In fact, so fast that the ink was still uh, able to be reconstituted, and this lady painted a picture of the octopus with that ink. Okay. So this, this indicates that this fossil must have been almost instant. And what about jellyfish? Jellyfish, as you know, if you go to the seashore, now you have a bit of a hike, but seashore, you know that when a jellyfish dies, it turns into mush in a matter of day or two. This is typical of a jellyfish. So uh, here we have fossilized jellyfish. So whatever happened must be, the fossilization process must be so fast that it didn't have time to turn into mush. Um, I was at Blue Beach Fossil Museum in uh, Nova Scotia, and there was a rock on this guy's table, about this big, this thick, this wide, and had all dimples on it. And I said, wow, it looks like these are made by raindrops. And he says, yes, he agreed with me. I says, wow, then that, he must have turned into fossils almost instantly. You know, hit, the, pockmarked the, the, the rock and then turned into, to, you know, to solidify. He says, no, it took millions of years. Uh, eventually he asked me to leave. So, <laughs> so we did get into a bit of a tussle. I said, that doesn't make any sense. Because everybody knows if you, well, you, today, right? You have a mud puddle. You got these raindrops puddling the, the, the mud. Well, the next layer of rain is going to wash it and wash, muddy it all. And, except this is with real distinct pockmark. He agreed there were raindrops. How do you account for that? They must have been instant. No, it took millions of years. Because he wanted them to be millions of years. He could not accept that fossilization was instant or fast. Another example of that, and we're moving along here, my, uh, my wife and I went to England in 2015 to a place called Knaresboro, west of York in England. And Mother Shipton has this park in which they have this petrifying well. And uh, so they have things that, uh, it's a waterfall, and they hang things in this waterfall. Now, this waterfall contains high amounts of calcium carbonate or limestone in order to, and, and they hang things there. And, of course, this accumulates in these things they hang there, whether boots or shoes or teddy bears. Okay, they hang in there. And after three months, said teddy bear turns into... So three months prior, this was a soft, cuddly teddy bear. Not so much now. Okay. That, my friends, is a concrete example of rapid fossilization. <laughs> okay. We also talked about earlier about uh, dinosaur DNA. And this is a very compelling argument, very hard to argue against. And so Dr. Mary Schweitzer, I mentioned in 2005, was digging through some unfossilized dinosaur bones, and she found this material, flexible, resilient, returned to its original shape. She also said they are virtually indistinguishable from tissue samples from modern species. 
species. And when you think about it, the laws of chemistry and biology and everything else that we know say that it should be gone, it should be degraded completely. Absolutely agree. That makes sense. Forensic science tells it exactly true. So when she first presented her findings to the scientific community, they all laughed at her. They say, Dr. Schweitzer, you're telling us that this is from Tyrannosaurus rex that died out 65 million years old, and you're telling us you have some organic material that looks like from modern samples? Come on, Dr. Schweitzer. We're not that dumb, okay? That's not how biology works. So you must have had some contamination in your lab, something from some other you know, biological experiment that got mixed up, and that's what you're presenting us today. So she was rebuked and then sent back to her lab, and she spent another 10 years looking at it, researching and stuff, doing all the protocols that you do, is supposed to do in a lab, and came back and said, sorry, folks, I have done the same thing over and over and over and over again. I still get the same results. So they eventually had to admit, yes, Dr. Schweitzer, this is dinosaur organic material, and guess what? This can last 65 million years. <laughs> of course, they had to say that because the obvious conclusion is that these things, this is modern uh, organic material, like maybe thousands of years old, but not 65 million. That would be, that would be ludicrous. But if they were to admit that, any scientist, any paleontologist who says, yes, I believe dinosaurs existed four and a half thousand years ago, is going to be marched out the door, even though the scientific evidence compels that to be the answer. This, unfortunately, the scientific, this is part of the culture we're living in today. It's not about truth. It's about agendas and ideologies and about telling stories, and there's lots more of that. You know, there's oil in Alberta, and, of course, we're paying for it at the pump. But uh, we're told that, according to, for example, another, also National Geographic, how do you get that oil? It relates to coal as well. You know, plants and, and uh, died and was buried, and over millions of years, slowly by heat and temperature, compresses and becomes coal and oil and natural gas and all this fossil fuel. That's what we're told. But is that actually true? Has anybody ever seen that? Well, actually, that's not true. Some physicists have actually done an experiment in the lab showing that you can get crude oil from algae in under an hour. So this is the same crude oil that you can use to refine for aviation fuel, car fuel, et cetera. It's the same stuff. So how, why should I believe it took millions of years to form when <laughs> actually we can do it in a laboratory and get the same results in one hour? Right. Hmm, you haven't been told that, have you? What about stalactites and stalagmites? Anybody been spelunking, cave exploring? Right. You'll see these stalactites and stalagmites, one of them coming from the top down, the other one's coming from the bottom up, and everyone really can remember which one is which. But So they said, don't touch that, sir, because that took hundreds of thousands of years to form, and you don't want to break it off. You're not going to live long enough to see it re reform. I said, forget it. That doesn't make any sense. We have these in Montreal. We don't have caves in Montreal, a lot like that, but we do have sewers. And in the sewers, we actually have stalactites and stalagmites. In fact, on the Montreal Tourism website, you can go in, and they're not being used at the moment, they're abandoned, but you can see a fully formed stalactite stalagmite in under 200 years. How do we know? Because humans built this thing, so we know exactly when it was built. So what's this idea about taking you know, millions of years to form, or hundreds of thousands of years to form? Um, almost finished, Pastor, I know it's... Uh, this is all good stuff, I think. Anyhow, so I've been in aviation for a long time, and I think this is the second to last one. I, I like it. Okay. So uh, in World War II, they had to get airplanes from North America over to Europe, and they flew them over Greenland. And one of this flight, it was a B-17, a number P-38 Lightning, landed in a storm. It landed on Greenland. And so the pilots walked away. They knew exactly where it was. There's a photo of, uh, you can see where it was. And so in the 1990s, an American rich guy, a Texan, you know, American rich, yeah, typical, right, said, I'm going to get me one of them planes, right? So he said, uh, well, okay, let's go to Greenland. We know where they are. We're going to start digging, and we'll pull one out. How deep can they be? That was the question. Well, a little research said that, well, you have a Greenland ice sheet 
let's say, three kilometers thick, and they're saying it's 100,000 years old to get three kilometers. So therefore, doing simple math, roughly about uh, six centimeters per year of ice accumulate. So six centimeters per year, that's about that much. Well, let's say there's 40 years, let's say uh, 50, 60 years, let's say it's 10 feet or three meters of ice. So they're only under 10 feet of ice. Not a problem. We'll just get some tools, equipment, we'll dig it out. So they started doing that. And they started digging. And they started digging. And they started digging. 285 feet deep. What? I thought you said they were only 10 feet deep but the 285 feet deep. They actually did go down and get, those, get one of those planes. Right? Wow, a little bit miscalculation, don't you think? Right? Wow, how does, so how do you explain that? Well, obviously, the actual rate of accumulation of snow, somebody thought well, maybe the planes got heated and slowly melt their way through, but that's not tenable. There's no heat source, and the sun isn't going to penetrate that deep. So how are you going to get them down? It's going to accumulate... The actual rate of accumulation was not 6 centimeters per year, but 1.7 meters per year. That's about 5 feet per year, which kind of makes sense in Greenland. I mean, it's a lot of snow. It's a big ice. Okay, so that's not, not out of the... So that explains it. So if I get 1.7 meters per year and I have 3 kilometers, that means the entire Greenland ice sheet could have been formed in less than 2,000 years. Hmm, well since the global flood of Noah, which would the flood would have created the Ice Age, an Ice Age. Okay. Wow. Now, it probably took more than 2,000 years, but anyway, it's certainly not hundreds of thousands of years old. The reason why this is significant is because climate change models use ice cores from the Greenland ice sheet as well as Antarctic ice sheet. And they look at all these layers... And they assume these layers that have taken all the way to the bottom 100,000 years. So that's where you get, you know, like halfway down, it's about 50,000 years. So then they start doing the calculation. The International Climate Change Panel are based on these assumptions, which we've just seen don't actually match the actual rate of accumulation. So the whole climate change is based on assumptions about the past which don't actually match reality. But please send in your taxes to the government, and they'll, they'll, they'll uh, don't go there, Gus, don't go there. Okay. So, one last thing, Pastor. Caves of Nica. Actually, on Amazon Prime, there's a video you can watch on the Caves of Nica. I highly recommend it because this is what we're going to talk about. So I was going on the internet and I came across this website called Naturalis Historia. And they said, the Nika Cave of Crystals is a giant problem for a young earth. So my ears perked up. Actually, my eyes perked up, but they don't make a lot of noise. So I looked at this and I said, what? Okay, so how do you, how do I resolve this question? If it's a huge problem, then, well, then let's, I should investigate it as one who semi-expert on this topic. Okay, so how would you make sense? Well, this guy is saying that young Earth proponents cannot accept the long history of these crystals, but rather believe they must have formed within the past 4,300 years. Yes, we cannot accept that they're hundreds of thousands or millions of years old, so they must be a lot younger. <sighs> well, how do we do? Well, they went to BBC. They talked about these caves as well. They said about 26 million years ago, and that over, very slowly, over hundreds of thousands of years, these crystals formed. Some of them are like 65 feet, like 13, like 20 meters long. Huge crystals, single crystals. As you can see here, it reminds me of the honey I shrunk to kids, right? You see this guy over here? Now, part of the problem is 58 degrees Celsius. What it was is a mine, and as the mines were getting deeper, they came across this. They had to pump out the water. They came across this crystal. And so these like, people have been going in there and doing experiments, et cetera, to find the crystal, et cetera, trying to find all the passageway, but it's incredibly hot. And there's no way to get rid of the heat. So although they have air-conditioned suits, they can only stay there in a short period of time, half an hour at most, and then they got to come out into an air-conditioned place. So uh, the, the mine people were saying, listen, we can't keep pumping water out of an abandoned mine forever. We're going to have to. So eventually they put the water, let the water go back in again. And so you can't really go there now. But there's an excellent video on Amazon Prime. So here you can see an example of it. So what is the problem here? 
The problem is the assumption. And in any argument, any debate, actually, you ask yourself, what are the assumptions being made here? And this guy, one of the assumptions is that crystals take a long time to form. It's, it's like hundreds of thousands of years, BBC. Did anybody actually see this uh, crystal form over hundreds of thousands of years? Absolutely not. But how fast do crystals form? Well, if you go to the dollar store or any other science store, you can buy crystal growing kits. And I'm pretty sure no kids wait in 100,000 years to grow any crystals. Right? <laughs> So they grow very instantly. In fact, and I'm shortening this up, but in the University of California, Los Angeles, wanted a crystal for experiment purposes, purposes, and they grew one. Here's a crystal two feet high, took them two months, roughly one month per foot. And if I have 65 feet long crystals, how many months am I gonna take? 65 months. You could have bought a brand new car with that period of time, right? 60 month purchase, but. So, probably better than having a crystal that long. But be, so what was happening is that uh, they were assuming that crystal, this crystal would take a long, long time to form. But that wasn't based on reality. That was based on the assumption they pulled out of their head. Right? The actual assumption, the reality is, and we can observe it, crystals can grow you know, very, very fast. And they even admitted when the water goes back in, the crystals are going to start growing again. So that means that these crystals cannot be hundreds of thousands of years, and it doesn't be millions of years ago. It's probably within the, uh, you know, could be years, tens of years. We don't know, but it's certainly not millions of years. One last thing. <laughs> I keep saying last thing. Uh, my coffee's getting cold here. I'm sorry. Mm. <clears throat> Big Bang. A lot of people, including Christian apologists, uh, used the Big Bang. William Lane Craig, uh, Frank Turek, others uh, liked the Big Bang. Because in, before the idea of the Big Bang, it was what they called the steady state theory. In other words, the universe had always existed, the steady state. And then somebody using the Hubble telescope, they noticed that the universe is expanding due to red shifts of stars, etc. So they said the universe is expanding. Well, if it's expanding forward in time, then it must have been uh, you know, smaller uh, in, 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 in reverse time, regression in time. So they, they said it would had to have a beginning, a singularity. And by looking at the expansion rate, they simply well extrapolated mathematically down to, well, 13.8 billion years ago, they said, when the Big Bang would have happened. Basically, there was nothing, and then it became something, and then it expanded for the whole universe, and it's still expanding. And it is still expanding. But part of the problem is, how fast is it expanding? Don't really know. It's very hard to calculate. In fact, here's one say, Associated Press article saying that the universe may be billions of years younger than we thought. And the last thing, it is difficult to be certain of your conclusion if you use a ruler that you don't fully understand. <laughs> so they're using these mathematical concepts to come up with the age of the universe, but how do you validate those mathematical concepts? Well, against what do you do? You can't take it into a lab. There's, cosmology is not really an empirical science. You can't ever do any experiment. You just have abs observations, and then you hypothesize about what might have transpired or what may take the place. In fact, some scientists are even saying there never was a Big Bang. Never Big Bang. Well, if the scientists themselves are having qualms about this, then I'm not going to stand on the Big Bang. As a matter of fact, there's one thing that the Big Bang relies on, it's dark matter. You may have heard of dark matter. And uh, dark matter is that mysterious, unobserved matter to make the universe work. And as Science Against Evolution does, if dark matter doesn't exist, then the story about stars and planets formed is mathematically impossible because there isn't enough gravity to do the job. If there isn't any dark matter, it disproves the Big Bang cosmology. In other words, when they did the, looked at the universe, they looked at all the physical stuff, the stars and the galaxies, and they calculated sort of the gravity. All these things have certain gravity to the calculation, and then they realized that there isn't enough mass to hold the universe together by just those observed material, physical matter. So then they said, well, but it's holding together. So there must be some material we can't see. 
this invisible stuff called dark matter. But they've been spending a lot of money, a lot of experiments to see if they can find this dark matter, and they're admitting now that dark matter, as the guy says here, dark matter, we still haven't found it, our theories are falling apart, is it time to rethink the universe? Now this is the scientists who are saying that. These are the guys who study this for a living. They're unsure about this. And the reason why I bring it up is that Christians should not be saying this is absolute truth. Like Lisa, Alisa Childhurst has on her YouTube or Facebook page. She says, the Big Bang is one of the greatest proofs of the existence of God. She gets this from guys like you, Ross, Canadian astrophysicist, reason to believe, doesn't believe in the flood, Noah, all that stuff. Because when the big, bus, big Bang goes bust, what then happens to one of the greatest proofs of the existence of God? Instead of it being a faith builder, it will be a faith destroyer. Right? If people go around, these big name guys like William Lane Craig and Frank Turk and saying, well, the Big Bang is, boy, this is our greatest evidence for the existence of God. And then the, media, the scientists who move on said, we no longer even believe in it. What happens to our, our greatest evidence? It just goes poof. And they're gonna, Christians are going to look foolish for hanging their hat on something that isn't stable. It's like hanging, building a house on sand. That's the problem. And I'm saying that this, people like this, very irresponsible. They should know better. So Big Bang, I just let you know that it is something that's just falling apart. It just does not work. It doesn't work. There's a lot of other issues for that. Dark matter not being found is one of the reasons for it. Okay, so does science support a young world or an old one? Now, does it prove the or creation account? No. But it does show us that the actual observed scientific data is in conformance to the biblical account. The Earth it doesn't support millions of years or evolutionary theory. It does support the biblical account. Does it prove it? No. This is not provable. You cannot prove anything in the past, certainly not scientifically. Okay. So, again, the scenario is God made everything very good. Adam and Eve brought death and disease and suffering into the world. And when we see the fossil records, this is all post Adam and Eve. And a lot of it is captured in the flood, which brought the sedimentation and the strata and all the fossils, which are of the same age of the strata, which of about 4,500 years ago. Okay. So I'm suggesting that you can believe the Bible from the very first verse. You do not need to be intimidated. Now, I'm pretty sure that you're going to forget a lot of this stuff maybe by the time you reach the parking lot. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I know myself, I forget a lot of stuff. Fortunately, I have, that's why I have to look at my screen here because I, I can't remember all this. There's so much stuff to remember. But what happens then in six months' time? You say, oh, I heard some guy, he's a good-looking guy from Montreal, by the way, but, you know, <laughs> you know, I heard this guy, but I don't, he said something, I can't quite remember what it was. So what then? You just... Forget it. You need something to then you can refer to. Well, that's where the creation magazine comes in. Because you get it all the time and it's always kept current within three months of what's going on. So you would have something in the news, you know, they found such and such, they found uh, amino acids on an asteroid. What does that mean? Well, somebody has to interpret what that means. And if you, you don't have any resources, okay, you're going to be kind of at a loss. And somebody asks you, yeah, but they found, you know, a four legged whale fossil. It actually did. It actually publicized. Four-legged whale fossil showing how whales evolved from a land animal over millions of years. And people say, well, he did. there's the proof. Well, what do you do with that? How do you interpret that? You're saying, oh, I, I don't know anything about that. So you can't really defend your faith, especially since science is one of the areas which are the church is one of the weakest in, where we don't even talk about it because it's all well, too complicated, etc. So that's why you need to equip yourselves. At least have the resources available. One lady said, I'm looking for something that I can give to one of the friends of mine. Something that I can give to, you know, answer questions. Great idea. And again, Creation Magazine, we already mentioned that uh, earlier on, number one equipping tool, highly recommend. And it's very affordable. Okay. So how that works is, and I'm going to ask the um, ladies with the clipboard, how this works is you need to sign up. 
And you sign up for this. And how to sign up? There is a form, a creation form, and they're going to pass it out. And uh, you tear off one of the sheets on the bottom, and you put your personal information on one side. And on the other side, you're going to put payment information, such as the information found on a, uh, a void check, banking information, or credit card information. So it'll come out your credit account. Uh, uh, please sign it, because without a signature, it's not, not worth anything. And as you sign up, you get your free gift, a free DVD, and a free magazine today. So I highly recommend that, uh, especially if you have children or grandchildren. Okay. I would highly recommend that. Okay, answers book, 60 most often asked questions about creation and evolution. There's also a pack with another book where you get a discount. Evolution's Achilles heel. These are our science, our PhD science. We're just talking about the science stuff. If you have somebody who says, oh, I'm into science, this is the book for them. Because it answers all those questions, which are the strong points of evolution. You say, well, let's look at it from a creationist point of view that it's not quite what you think it is. And if you buy the DVD, you also get a, uh, a, a discount on that as well. And for those of you who say, listen, I'd really love to get all of these resources, but I only have $199, <laughs> this is the pack for you. It's actually $360 worth of resources for $199. So if you want to equip yourself with resources, now, most people don't buy that, but uh, in, the people in BC did. One lady did buy it. So just to let you know that somebody in BC bought it. Okay, just, uh, <laughs> this is how Westerners, you're all rich out here, farmers and so on. So, so again, creation.com as a free resource. You can go and get all kinds of uh, articles. And there's volumes, massive volumes. How do you, go in the search bar, search engine, you find all kinds of stuff. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, that is it. I'm done. Well, thank you very much, Gus, for filling our heads, encouraging our hearts. We're going to not take up an offering uh, tonight. We will give an honorarium because Gus made us feel bad because his shares of Bombardier are going down. <laughs>